Okay, hi. Um, hi from Dublin. I'm going to get straight into it. Uh, so, the paper is called Cavendish and Barclay on Inconceivability and Impossibility. Um, comes out of my background working on Barclay and uh, a relatively recent um, interest in, in Margaret Cavendish. Um, and spawned out of the fact that I observed that Barclay and Cavendish have a very similar argument, which I will lay out um, in a couple of minutes. Um, okay. So kind of overview of the paper. So my thesis, thesis of the paper is something like this. Um, Comparing Cavendish's argument for the view that colors are inseparable from physical qualities, size and shape of bodies with Barclay's argument for the view that secondary qualities are inseparable from primary qualities reveals that both are committed to what I call uh, an empiricist modal epistemology. Okay, the upshots of the paper. So there's, there's maybe four upshots that come out of this paper. Um, I think that it's interesting for people working on Barclay, but I think the upshots are primarily leaning towards Cavendish scholarship and our understanding and the way we characterize Karen Cavendish as a thinker in the early modern period. So first of all, and this is really an observation, um, one that's been noted by other commentators, but one which I pick up on a bit more depth, Cavendish and Barclay develop structurally analogous inseparability arguments. And I will show you my reconstruction of those in a moment. The second upshot, both of those arguments uh, rely on uh, an implicit acceptance of what we might call the inconceivability principle, which is the claim that inconceivability entails impossibility. Number three, so this is not unique to these thinkers, um, lots of claims during the early modern period about the relationship between conceivability and possibility. But what I argue is that Cavendish and Barclay both accept this inconceivability principle for what we might call empiricist rather than say rationalist reasons. And I'm using those terms quite loosely. In other words, there's no connection to a priori truths. Uh, both of them accept a view which connects conception, perception and existence. And the upshot, the kind of final outcome of this, is that there is more empiricism in Cavendish and her epistemology than the current literature would suggest. And the current literature suggests that there's very little. So here's the two arguments, the inseparability arguments. So Cavendish argues, if I cannot conceive of two things existing separately, then they cannot exist separately. I cannot conceive of physical qualities of objects existing separately from colors. And I should note that Colin Chamberlain's paper is what got me into this argument in the first place. Therefore, physical qualities of objects cannot exist separately from colors. Barclay's argument, and you'll see how similar they look. If I cannot conceive of two things existing separately, then they cannot exist separately. I cannot conceive of secondary qualities existing separately from primary qualities. Therefore, secondary qualities cannot exist separately from primary qualities. And what's important for my purposes is to note that the key premise, the major premise in those arguments, in both cases relies on an implicit acceptance of the inconceivability principle. This is the part where most of the interpretive heavy lifting comes in, answering the question of why these thinkers accept the inconceivability principle. Um, Barclay, thinks SA is percopy, he thinks that for a thing to exist is for it to be perceived, which means that for a thing to possibly exist is for it to be possibly be perceived. And since Barclay thinks that we cannot conceive of something that could in principle, could not in principle um, be perceived, it follows that if I cannot conceive of something, then that something could not possibly exist. Cavendish does not think that SA is percopy, but perception nonetheless plays a key role in her system of nature. So for example, she says, every action in nature is a knowing and perceptive action. And I argue that there's a good reason to think every part of nature for Cavendish is perceived. This second claim again requires a kind of lot of interpretive unpacking, but Cavendish, there's good evidence that Cavendish thinks that there's a close connection between conceivability and imperceptibility. 
And I argue that all of this means that like Barclay, Cavendish thinks that if something is inconceivable, then it's imperceptible. And if it's imperceptible, then it could not possibly exist. So what comes out of this, I argue, is what we might call an empiricist modal epistemology. So for both thinkers, knowledge of what could possibly exist is reducible to knowledge of what could in principle be perceived. So to borrow an analogy from the famous Raphael painting, uh, Cavendish and Berkeley, when it comes to modal epistemology, are downward looking and not upward looking, right? They're not interested in a priori truths, they're interested in perception and its connection to existence. Okay, thank you very much, Colin and Benjamin, and thank you all very much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Both Cavendish and Barclay criticized the distinction between primary and secondary qualities on the grounds that it is impossible to conceive of a body without both kinds of qualities, from which they infer that a body can't exist without both. Cavendish, for example, suggests that you can't conceive of a body without attributing some kind of color to it. This style of argument obviously presupposes that inconceivability implies impossibility. Peter West's excellent question is, what, if anything, entitles Cavendish and Berkeley to this assumption? Why should our powers of conception track what is and is not possible? I, for one, would love to know the answer to this question. He argues, West, that is, argues first, that both Cavendish and Berkeley hold that something can exist in nature only if it can be perceived or experienced by someone or something, and second, that something can be perceived or experienced only if it can be thought or conceived. Hence the connection between what can be the case of nature and what we can conceive. Cavendish and Berkeley on West's reading give slightly different accounts of why something can exist in nature only if it can be experienced. For Berkeley, the existence of a sensible thing like an apple, a mountain, or a river consists in being perceived. Hence, possible existence equals perceptibility. For Cavendish, it's a bit more complicated. West argues that Cavendish commits herself to the claim that every part of nature is perceived because a nature is a planet so every part of nature is surrounded by other parts and b every part of nature is perceived by its neighbors so here i want to push back a little bit because there are a bunch of passages where cavendish suggests that not all parts perceive their neighbors some do some don't so if we're going to argue that for cavendish every part of nature is perceived by some other part we need a different argumentative strategy Here's one possibility. I would like to suggest that Cavendish thinks of nature as one big causal system, where being part of nature requires being capable of causal interaction with other parts. And Cavendish seems to think that causal interaction presupposes perception. If that's right, then Peter West might be able to show that every part of nature is perceived by some other part, because that's what it takes to be part of the causal system that is nature. There's a lot more to be said about West's rich and thought-provoking paper. I think he is right to see many interesting similarities between Cavendish and Berkeley, despite their different public relations strategies for describing their views, and I'm excited to hear more from him about this comparison. Thanks. Uh, well, you'll get your chance because now we will have five minutes uh, for Peter to respond to those comments and then we will move into Q&A. Great. Um, so I made some notes and I might just read from those if that's all right. And if I go on for too long, then, then please tell me. Um, so, so thanks, first of all, to, to Colin for reading what was quite a long paper for a conference paper. Um, and he provided some really, really helpful feedback. So I have lots of questions for him, but I'll, but I'll, well, maybe some of them will come out. We'll see. Um, and I guess I don't really want to kind of defend my paper in any way, um, because I thought the comments were really helpful. Um, so what I might just do is, is maybe summarize what has, what Colin has said in response in my, in, as well as I understood it and respond, um, to maybe three major points that Colin raises. So, um, I think one of the big the big issues, um, so Colin, um, one point he raises is that the inconceivability principle, which I attribute to Cavendish and Berkeley, um, either seems to be or should be or is, but I just don't say it, uh, restricted to things in nature. Um, so what Berkeley calls sensible things, what Cavendish calls parts of nature. Um, 
And I guess my response to that is, uh, this was kind of on the periphery when I was writing this paper and basically Colin hasn't, didn't let me get away with, with, with not saying enough about it. So that's um, fair enough. Um, and I think that I'm okay with that. I think it does the work that I want it to do anyway. I think it's probably just something that I need to make clearer. Um, second good point that, that Colin raises um, is, and this may be the biggest issue with the paper, I think, after a bit of reflection, is that I may be um, equivocating over the use of the, the way I use the word perception um, in Cavendish and maybe in Barclay too. Um, so I suggest that both of these thinkers think we make conceptual claims based on what we are what, on what we are able to perceive. But then when I start to talk about Cavendish, um, it's perception in a much broader sense than just what you or I perceive. So um, yeah, this may simply be something that I need to work out in terms of how I frame um, my reconstruction, or it may be a bigger issue, but it's something that, that I'm definitely gonna put some thought to. Um, and I guess the third thing, so, so Colin had a couple of really helpful suggestions of how, of alternative ways to get to the claim that for Cavendish, um, every part of nature is perceived. Um, and I guess one thing that was helpful that he pointed out is that what I really want for Cavendish, as I think is the case with Barclay, is the view that for something to be a part of nature, it would be would have to be perceived by necessity rather than um, in a in a contingent sense. So that was really helpful. And I guess the final thing um, that, that, that that Colin in, in his written notes pushed me on a bit was coming back to some of the bigger issues, uh, bigger picture things or connections between Barclay and Cavendish. Um, and basically, I'm I'm kind of glad that this is something that that seems to be of interest because originally the paper was kind of a bit more big picture. So I was interested in thinking about how Barclay and Cavendish both argue for monism, but give it very different names. Um, and then I kind of wasn't sure whether they are actually monists. Um, so I kind of backed away from some of that stuff. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically the, all I have to say, I guess, at the moment. But they were, they were really helpful um, comments and questions. Uh, all right, uh, Colin, would you like to add anything before we move into Q&A or should we go directly to questions? Let's just go directly to questions. All right, I've checked the site and there don't appear to be uh, pre-comments posted there. So we'll just go ahead with the hand raise function. Uh, if people wanna add follow-ups, type, type something out in the chat and I'll try to um, incorporate follow-ups, but otherwise we'll just go by the hand raise function. To think about it more, uh, I, I'm less convinced that I, that I, that is actually a consensus view. Um, but so so it took it. Your question was that, or your one of your points was that there's signs in the dialogues that Philonus thinks it's important that even when it comes to things in nature, um, inconceivability doesn't entail impossibility. Was that well? So the 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 way the exchange seems to go in the dialogues is that when um hylas busts out the parody arguments mm -hmm. and says, hang on a second can i just turn all of your objections around on you when you start talking about mental substance um Philonis says oh no 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 i didn't object to material substance on the grounds that it was inconceivable i never levied the objection inconceivable therefore impossible mm -hmm. i said that you didn't have uh, establish a uh, ground on which you could believe it, you know? And so he sort of backs off of endorsing in that instance, the inconceivability principle. Now that might just be because of like the dialectical situation that he's got the two figures in the dialogue in, and it might be that Barclay himself is still willing to endorse it. 
but it just uh, it's it seemed like in the dialogue he sort of specifically has the one that everybody takes to be his mouthpiece um, at least on one way of reading it uh, yes. vociferously avoid saying no 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 I never said that just because you can't think of it in ideas it you know sure okay so I think I have I think I have a, a response to this um, so in that Holden paper that I'm talking about, he, he makes, so it, so it kind of troubled me as I was writing this paper because he makes quite a convincing case for thinking that when Barclay seems to rely on inconceivability, Barclay is relying on in, in, inconsistencies um, or maybe, um, maybe that, yeah, so, so, and definitely, and, and a good textual support for that is the fact that Barclay even in the three dialogues, although I make a point in my paper of saying he doesn't talk about that, he doesn't. So in the three dialogues, he talks about repugnancy, the repugnancy of um, even in the case of primary and secondary qualities, he says that there actually being a distinction between them involves a repugnancy, which certainly suggests that it's inconsistency or contradiction or something that's that the Barclay's relying on. So, so I mean, one thing I'd say is like. He doesn't talk about repugnancy in, in the principles when it, when it, so, but, but that, but that, and, and so anyway, but, so basically Holden's point, so, so here's how Holden frames it. The consensus is everybody thinks it's inconceivability that's doing it, the work. Actually, it's um, repugnancy or inconsistency. I guess my view, and I'd have to think about this a bit more, but I think, I think that he makes a pretty good case for thinking that in case of the parity argument, yeah, it's actually inconsistency, which is why um, matter is impossible, not inconceivability. That's fine. So I think maybe what this is down to is a little bit of unclarity, lack of clarity on Barclay's behalf about when he means inconceivability and when he means inconsistency, because he definitely uses both of those terms all over the place a little bit. So, so I guess that that's that's my response. So I so for the purposes of purposes of this paper, I think it's inconceivability that does the work when it comes to the primary secondary quality distinction. So I don't think that I need to kind of have a knockdown argument for thinking that it's ever inconsistency which does the work. Does that kind of respond to to your point? Certainly, I've gotten a good amount uh, of uh, help and understanding of what you're talking about, and I should let other people ask their questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I think we have a quick follow up from uh, Colin and then we'll move to the next uh, question from David Bartha. Uh, Colin, did you want to follow up? Oh, sure. This is like a super small thought. Maybe Barclay holds both the unrestricted principle, like if P implies a contradiction, then P is impossible, and the restricted principle for natural sensible things, if like P is a natural thing and inconceivable broader sense then it's impossible um, so yeah I, I, so i would be i i, I would be like okay. that sounds okay to me but i guess it depends whether matter or material substance counts as a sensible thing or not i mean yeah, barclay thinks yeah, it doesn't yeah. I would assume that i guess um so yeah so i think i would be sympathetic to that but i but that, i think the 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 so I think if you, if you want to think about it like this, the best argument for trying to show that it's inconceivability that does the work is the, is the inseparability argument as regards to primary and secondary qualities. The best argument for thinking that it's inconsistency that does the work is probably the one against matter or material substance. Cool. There are a couple more follow-ups in the chat, but I think we can um, circle back to those after we've taken uh, some additional questions. Um, and maybe those uh, people have the chance to raise those um, thoughts in their questions as well. So uh, let's go on to a question from David Bartha. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Peter, for the exciting talk. What I wanted to ask is basically the same issue, I guess. So if, how can you attribute the inconceivability principle to Berkeley in face of, of passages like principles 81, where he says that the scantiness of our comprehension shouldn't be basically a guide to what ideas God can bring about, which probably he gets from Locke. You find things like this in, in Hume as well. So it seems 
he clearly didn't accept this principle as a general across the board methodological principle. So maybe he, if he relies in this argument on, on the principle, then he's just inconsistent, I think. So that's a good motivation to find a different interpretation. And I, I always thought that you might think that what he want, wants to say is simply that the shape without color is a conceptually impossible thing because shape needs boundaries and boundaries are provided by, by other shaped things with the boundaries. This has to be a difference in color because otherwise you couldn't pick out the, the shape of, of a thing. So, and probably then, then it's not really about what you can conceive psychologically, but it's a conceptually impossible thing. Yeah. Okay. Um... I think I had two things, but I might have to come back and ask you so that I can remind myself what the first thing I wanted to say was. Uh, I mean, if it were the case that something particular were going on in the case of colors for Barclay, or maybe secondary qualities more generally, that might be interesting for my purposes, at least in terms of pointing out another similarity with Cavendish, because but it would involve a bit of rejigging of the paper. But I mean, so one thing, so Cavendish basically employs the, in, the conceivability, separability, uh, the inconceivability, inseparability argument, specifically a color. And, and, it's, and there's a couple of other cases where it seems to be at work, but it's not, not necessarily something more general. Um, so that, anyway, so that, that, that might be interesting. Um, yeah, the first thing, I don't remember exactly what he says in Principles 81, but I mean, one thing that, that Thomas Holden is quite keen to point out is, so, you, so I, might just be, I might just be barking up the wrong bush, so, so tell me, but like, so Holden points out these passages where Barclay says things like, um, Yeah, that there's like, the, yeah, right. So there might be a whole bunch of sensations that maybe angels or something can can perceive that, but we can't. And if we inferred from the fact that we can't perceive them, then we'd be like uh, the person born blind who uh, infers that there are no light and colors. Is is that the kind of thing that you were? You were yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know exactly what my response to that is. Um, I mean, so it, it, it may, I, it's not very satisfying and I don't want to, I don't think I want to hedge my bets on this being the answer, but it, it may be, maybe uh, inconsistency on Barclay's behalf. I mean, one thing that I think is interesting looking at this debate in Barclay's scholarship is the strength of the case that you can put forward for whether Barclay accepts the inconceivability principle really depends like where you start in the text. Um, so I think like what I do is, you know, cause I start with the primary secondary quality distinction. It's quite, until I start getting into the secondary literature stuff, it's quite easy to make the case for thinking that this is, I mean, in that isolated incident, it looks like it's just like with Cavendish, it looks like it's playing a really important role. Whereas if you start at somewhere else, it, 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 it looks different. So I, I think the answer is probably, as Colin was suggesting, the I, I'm pretty I'm pretty convinced that in this case at least, and and I think in this case at least, yeah, some kind of restricted inconceivability principle is 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 playing a role. I think there are other cases in the in the, in Barclay's works where more broadly the relationship between conceivability and possibility definitely plays a role. I mean, if you're talking about ideas, like it, like it plays a really big role in, in terms of the argument against abstract ideas, but ideas are a bit different because they exist by being conceived. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a muddled answer, but I don't even know if it's an answer. But. All right, well, th uh, thank you. Um, we'll move on now to a question from Kenny Pierce. Hey, Peter. Um, I just had a, a quick question slash suggestion about Cavendish. So uh, I'm, I'm not real confident of my, uh, of my Cavendish interpretation and kind of knowledge of the text and so forth. But uh, I thought that Cavendish said in a number of places that nature herself is all knowing. 
And whereas somebody like Barclay denies, who talks about God, denies that God perceives by sense as we do. Normally God's knowledge or perception is very different than ours. I think that for Cavendish, uh, isn't nature's knowledge or perception actually, as it were, built out of the knowledge that all the pieces of nature has? So if, if nature herself knows, perceives, senses everything, then isn't that going to imply not just that everything is perceived by nature, but that everything is also perceivable by the finite parts of nature and um, perhaps actually perceived by mm -hmm. the, the finite parts of nature? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so Cavendish on perception is like a whole can of worms. Um, and, and, I, and the analogy I always use is like, it's like untying uh, a knot in like a phone cable. Like you think you've gotten to the bottom of it and then there's always another one. Um, so there's like several distinctions between different kinds of perception and different part, types of matter that do different types of perceiving. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that's actually quite nice. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that. I mean, so I, I think it's, I think I'm, I'm pretty, I think it's, I think it's pretty plausible that she thinks that all parts of nature as a matter of fact are perceived and actually that to be a part of nature is to be perceived. Um, and I think that Colin agreed with me, at least on that particular claim. Um, the, the question is just how to get there. Um, so one thing, this maybe is similar to one thing that Colin had suggested to me, which, I mean, so one thing I don't really talk about in the paper, but might have to play a role is self-knowledge. So um, every part of nature, as well as perceiving some other part of nature. I'm not really sure. I, I, I think maybe what Cavendish actually thinks is that um, perception of other parts of nature happens by means of self-perception or self-knowledge, um, which maybe makes Cavendish sound a bit Leibnizian or something. Um, so, um, that, yeah, that, that it, it may be, right, and she definitely says that all of nature she says that it's not the case that every part of nature has knowledge of every other part of nature, but the sum total of all the different parts of nature has like this infinite knowledge because knowledge, because nature is, is infinite. Um, yeah, that might be, that might be something to think about. Thanks very much. Uh, it sounds like what you just said covers uh, Lewis Powell's follow-up, which is about the distinction between nature's self-knowledge and nature's all knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so unless there's anything else to add there, uh, I think we can move on to the question from Graham Clay. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm kind of sympathetic to some of these uh, concerns about the principle in Berkeley, um, but I wonder just as a helpful suggestion, it kind of seems to me like it might not really matter for what you're ultimately after because you could run this paper either way. So like some of the stuff that Cavendish is saying seems to indicate the inconsistency view, um, namely some of the, her, her first argument for inseparability, which I'll come to in a second, um, doesn't seem to turn on uh, mere conceivability, in, inconceivability implying impossibility. And so I wonder if like you could just say, hey, I'm gonna stay silent on this Holden debate uh, in the Barclay literature. Um, maybe Barclay endorses the broader conceivability principle. Maybe he needs contradictions for them to be impossible. But either way, Cavendish is in the same ballpark. You can read her one way or you can read her the other way. That's just a helpful thought. So then you don't need to like take a stand there. You can just say like conditional on it being them both agreeing about this, then that and vice versa. So I just, there's evidence pushing both ways on both of them. So I just think like you could just kind of punt on that because it's kind of, I guess not that material to your broader point. So that's just kind of a helpful suggestion. Um, based on what some other people are saying about uh, that issue, which I'm, I'm sympathetic with the concerns. Um, but relatedly, um, your first, the first Cavendish argument for the inseparability, it's on page nine and 10, um, I believe. Uh, you say, well, she has this argument that says, uh, when the physical qualities of an object alter, so do their colors. Mm -hmm. And you, you say, hey, well, this has a problem it, it relies on this premise, if changes in one quality of an object always coincided, coincide with changes in another quality, then those qualities are inseparable from one another. You say without further argumentation, there's go, no good reason to accept this premise. Uh, 
Um, for instance, you know, you could have a causal relation that explains this. Uh, but not quite. I mean, it depends on how you understand causation and the always in her claim. So if it's like a supervenience claim, for instance, that kind of changes the character of the dialectic there. And so I was wondering kind of if you could say a little bit more on what exactly the relationship is on her view. Because if the always is a necessary always in the sense that um, sense of supervenience that contemporary philosophers mean now, then your causal response doesn't work unless you presume causation is like a necessary relation um, in a way that many philosophers don't presume, particularly of this era, a uh, human being, obviously a good example. Can you say more about that? Um, yeah, um, I'll try to. So, I mean, just to come back to the first point you made, yeah, in terms of the paper itself, I wasn't really sure how to, so I do actually go into quite a lot of depth in my res, in responding to this debate in Berkeley literature about whether to attribute to him the inconceivability principle. And I think with a bit of feedback and in with a bit of reflection, it it may be slightly detracting from the from the actual point of the paper itself. I think that maybe is so maybe there's a way of kind of putting it on hold. Um, I think it's just because I know it's something that people who know Barclay are going to jump on, so I want to have something to say about it. Um, so yeah, so thank you very much. That that and, and I, I hadn't really considered that the Cavendish might also have an inconsistency view as well. Um, so that's definitely something to think about. Um, so yeah, then so coming back to this 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 other argument. So right, so there's a chapter in the observations which is on colors specifically and. From from how I read it, there's like seems to be two arguments for the view that colors are inseparable from qualities like size and shape. Um, the second one is the one, the inseparability one that I talk about. The first one is this argument, which is something like um, every time. So so this so this is maybe beginning to respond to what you were were asking me about. So. As I read it, what she, so she's kind of saying, if you go out and there's some things you can go out and observe, which seem to indicate that colors are just as inseparable from material things as other physical qualities. And she says, take the example of the tempering of steel. So every time the physical qualities of steel change, its color changes, um, it's, its color always, yeah, as you say, always, that's interesting, um, changes with it. Um, so I guess the reason I don't, I guess the reason I don't read that as a particularly convincing argument, and I say in the paper, like, it may be so unconvincing that it's more charitable not to read it as a standalone argument. It's actually a kind of pushback against those who might say that the observable world confirms the primary secondary quality distinction or makes it more likely or something. And I guess the reason I don't think that is because I, I don't think it's a claim about laws or necessity or rules, at least as I understand what she's doing there. I think it's, she's kind of saying, pointing to something in the world and saying, when this happens, this always happens. I mean, so I don't, I don't remember where, but I've seen somebody say that Cavendish is actually somewhat kind of Humean in this sense, in that she's more interested in pointing out that it's just, you know, we just observe things, but that doesn't mean there's a necessary connection between them. So maybe with that in the back of my mind, I don't really see that as what she's doing there. She's just kind of saying, look, this is this always happens. Um, but as I read it, it's just a way of saying like, um, you can't, you, the mechanists, can't use this as evidence of your view because it also points towards my view. I don't know if that, but that's that's what's going on in my head when I'm reading that passage. Okay. Yeah, that helps a lot. I guess I I don't know the text, and so that that kind of answers the question for mm -hmm. uh, for me. But I was also just thinking, my ears pricked up because there's just so much literature on supervenience, like when it comes to the supervenience of the normative on the natural, and what that means for the relationship between the properties. And I was thinking that it might be worth a second look of the text, surrounding text, because she if she relies on some principle that's parallel to the principles that people use to move from supervenience in the ethical domain to stronger claims about, you know, non-naturalism. Um, that might be interesting. Um, so, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you.
Uh, thank you. Uh, we have four more hands uh, in the queue and about 16 minutes to go. So uh, let's try to get through all those, though I do remind people that the opportunity exists for further uh, comments and back and forth after the session is over. So with that, let's go to Russell Wall. I have just two very brief points uh, that I think might help you. <clears throat> in in the slide, anyway, at the very beginning here, you had, uh, when talking about uh, Barclay, you, uh, uh, Barclay's inconceivability argument, you were doing it in terms of uh, that secondary qualities can't be conceived without primary qualities. An awful lot of people who held the distinction would, would agree with that. If you reverse primary and secondary, it'll be really nice. <laughs> it, it would be back the argument that he, that, that he was known that, that, and also parallel to the Cavendish argument. That's one very minor point. The other point is uh, that uh, <clears throat> I think w when we're talking about inconceivability, uh, this might help you with the other issue that came up. I don't think you want to identify conceivability with having an idea, given what Barclay did about being able to think about think abstractly without having abstract ideas, and the whole business about being able to think of God and without having an idea of God that is the distinction that's made, in fact, in the three dialogues at that very point where he says, it isn't that I don't have an idea that makes me, he didn't say it's because it isn't inconceivable. It's that he said, it's not just because I don't have an idea, it's because having the idea of it would be impossible. Now it's true, you still have some work to do with, it, with that, but it's not quite as extreme as just simply identifying conceivability with having an idea of Barclay. That's all. Thanks. Um, yes, thank you for that first point. I think maybe I had thought about that and didn't, didn't change it in time, um, about which way around those words were. Um, also, I realized that in the slide, I highlighted the wrong premise, um, just in case anybody goes back and sees that. Um, the second thing, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm gonna regret saying this. I kind of, I, I think in Barclay, conceiving does mean having an idea. But I don't think you, I don't think Barclay thinks you can conceive of, in a strict sense, of the nature of God or anything about God or minds. So, it, so this is, I mean, this is where notions come in, right? Um, the, 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 the famously uh, ambiguous term. Um, so, this is why I'm, I'm really happy to attribute to Barclay a restricted inconceivability claim. Maybe this comes back to some of the stuff we were talking about with other people's questions. Yeah, I, I actually agree. And this is why I think just from what people had, had said to me um, and what Colin had said to me, it's, it's, it's got to be a, a, some kind of restricted inconceivability claim because there's, and, and I think David was saying something similar. There's passages in Barclay where he says there definitely are some things that you can't conceive of. Um, and, and the same is true of Cavendish, which is why I'm happy to, because she, she, she believes in God, but God exists outside of nature. So she thinks that everything inside of nature that is part of nature is conceivable, but there is God who isn't. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so I think that's why, I, I do think that conceiving means having an idea, but I, but I think that that's a particular understanding of conceiving. Uh, all right, uh, Colin, do you have a question or a follow-up? Can I just move to the bottom of the queue so people yeah, can talk? Yeah, that it? works. Uh, then we'll go to a question from Shoshana Brassfield. Hi there. Um, this is very interesting. So I really just want to ask about the way I thought about the conceivability argument in Barclay. Um, maybe this is uncharitable. Um, is just that he's confusing conceivability um, with or conception, right, with imagination. Um, and so he, anything he can't imagine, he says he can't conceive. Um, and uh, it's hard for me to figure out what's going on in Cavendish. Um, she maybe doesn't do this accidentally. She may do that on purpose. She says, it's impossible to imagine a body without a color. Um, now we might think those come to the same thing that what it is, um, imagination is just the same thing as possible perception, um, but it's not. And maybe those, which I wonder whether they are the same thing since um, 
<laughs> imagination doesn't require perception. Um, and if the point is to show that Cavendish has this empiricist element, then it might matter whether she's actually thinking about it as possible perception. Um, and it also might matter what kind of perception she's thinking of it as. And um, this is, gets into the can of worms, which I can't claim to quite understand. But it seems like she doesn't want to say that, um, right, colors have to, I don't know, what is it? Uh, there are colors which were never presented to our sensitive organs, um, right? So if the colors that we imagine, right, are not colors that have to be perceived through, um, or if they're perceived by an interior perception, um, then I'm not sure whether empiricist is the right way to describe that. Um, so it's really just sort of an open question what you want to um, say or do with that. Maybe you can help me understand what Cavendish is saying more clearly. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, that this, yeah, I, I, I think I liked things that you were hinting at, but maybe you were saying they were not good things, but I like them. Um, I think Barclay, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna say it and maybe I'll take it back later. I think Barclay thinks, con I think conceiving and imagining are the same thing in Barclay. Um, and, and I think as, as Kenny said there in the, in the chat, I don't think that it's confusion. I think it's an identification. And uh, as far as I can tell, and I've seen people in the literature say the same thing, this is also true of Cavendish, um, which may be worth something, it may be something that it's worth me picking up on explicitly when I'm making this case for Cavendish being, not being an empiricist, but having some empiricist tendencies. Um, because I think that if you make, if you equate conceiving and imagining, then you're bringing imagining down to the level much closer to perception. I mean, to use that metaphor again, right? You're, you're, it's a downward looking thing rather than some higher form or something that, that's like above and beyond um, perception. And I guess like, so as I read Barclay, to, to con yeah, to conceive, or, or to imagine, to imagine is to possibly perceive something, right? So he says, so he rejects the existence of abstract ideas. He says, you can't, can, you can't have an idea of just redness. You also can't have an ab abstract idea of triangularity or of tree, the tree um, or the, the human. Um, but what you can conceive of is a particular tree and then make it stand for all the other trees and you can conceive and so, yeah, so you can conceive of it, which is the same thing as you can imagine it, which is the same thing as you could possibly perceive it. And he has this thing where he says, you know, I can abstract in a sense, so I can, I, I say I went outside and saw a tree and then I lay in bed at night, I can imagine one of the branches of that tree, like abstracted, that is detached from the tree, but that's only because that thing that I'm conceiving could possibly exist that is, it could possibly be perceived by me. So, um, so I think I'm okay with all of that. And, and, um, and, I, and I think that might be something that, that is interestingly true of um, Cavendish as well. Well, but I think the issue is that, I don't know, the way I understand empiricism is it implies that we, um, the way we know things, right, is that we get information that wasn't in us from outside us. Um, and so, right. So, the question so is, is she thinking about this conceivability argument as what conceivability is, is the possibility of getting information not that doesn't come from inside, um, but come from outside, right? And is a conceivability just a matter of possibly getting this information from outside? And mm. that's less clear to me. And so that's yeah. really what I want to do. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this is this is something I need to work on. I think this is something that 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 it's become clear to me. It needs a bit of work in the paper um, because I because I need to work out what I think about the relationship between like human sense perception and perception in this much more general sense. Um, and I'm and I guess I'm guilty of getting the general kind of perception to do some work for me when I've said I'm talking about human perception. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I that I need to do to, to think about. But just to say, as, as I, so Cavendish says, 
yeah, Cavendish thinks you can only, um, yeah. So there's, she doesn't believe in ideas and stuff like that. It's all to do with patterning and figuring of the motions that make up your mind slash brain. But basically, she thinks you can only um, imagine things that you that you have uh, perceived or that are like copies or made up of bits of things that you have that are patterning the same way that they would be if you were perceiving something by your senses. All right, thank you. Uh, let's go to Jonathan Shaheen. Great, <clears throat> great, thanks. Um, hi, Peter. Uh, hi. So, um, just, when I see the claim that Cavendish thinks inconceivability entails impossibility, there are three cases that I worry about. And I think two of them are covered by the, the way you're gonna specify that principle, but I'm worried about a third. Mm -hmm. So the first one is like, Cavendish is skeptical about human conceivability in the sense that she thinks that we can't even conceive of all the things that are actual, much less possible because the world is infinite. Yeah. Um, that's gonna be covered because you don't mean just human conceivability, you mean, or perceivability, you mean perceivability in general. Um, <clears throat> the second kind of case is uh, God's creation of the world, she thinks, uh, like does not cohere with our ideas because the world's eternal. Um, but that's not a part of nature, so who cares about that? That's that's for that. Um, but the third thing is interior emotions, and I guess you're going to say they're not parts of nature. Um, but the way you talk about um, rational perception, as if um, and self knowledge and conception, seems like you think that she thinks that the interior emotions of a part of nature are perceived by that part. And my impression is not that she ever talks that way. Um, and she talks about interior emotions being things that are not perceived. Um, I think perception for her, and it could be that there are comments about rational perception that I'm not remembering, but generally perception is of stuff outside of you. And yeah. interior emotions are, um, I mean, it's interesting to try to figure out what exactly interior emotions are supposed to be. But one thing that seems to be true about them is that they're epistemically inaccessible to other parts of nature. So she says we can't perceive, that's why we can't know others' minds. We can't perceive the interior emotions of their rational matter. So, so there's no perceiving going on. She says that our rational matter can probably guess at them. Um, but interior emotions seem to me to be something they're definitely not perceived by other parts. And I don't know of her calling it perception when we know about our own interior emotions. And so do you want to define parts of nature such that that's not a counterexample to the claim. Um, you don't need it for the color thing. I'm just unclear about what the what exactly the claim is supposed to be. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem plausible. I don't think she think that you perceive. Yeah, because that would involve because perceiving is patterning, which is a kind of motion. So perceiving emotion would be patterning a pattern which would involve patterning another pattern. Um, and I guess if you translate that into Barclay talk, that's like, he doesn't think you can perceive perceivings or the activity of the mind. So there might be some kind of interesting similarity there. Um, I don't know, I guess, I, I guess I'd have to think about whether in whether the interior motion, whether, in, yeah, I think there's, a, I don't know, maybe motions aren't things in nature. Maybe they're like an underlying principle which determines, I mean, she thinks the individuation of objects is, is, is the result of, the reason there are different parts of nature and it isn't just a big homogenous blob is because all the different parts are moving in different ways, different, different patterns or whatever it is. Um, yeah, so I don't know. That's really interesting. I, I have to think about it, but that, that seems like quite important. But I, but I think I try and find a way of saying they're not actually things in nature. They're some kind of underlying activity or principle, which is, yeah, I don't know. Got if I can follow up really quickly, I'll tell you what I would say. Um, I mean, I'm committed in print to saying that the parts of nature are individuated as effects of motions. 
-hmm. So you have to think you can individuate the motions in order to individuate the, <laughs> the parts as their effects. But the motions themselves are not then parts. There are things that make parts. Okay, that, that, I'm so glad you that you that. said that because that that would be. I was just <laughs> hesitant to make that claim, but I think that sounds that sounds like probably where I would go with that. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so we just have a couple minutes left. If um, Callum, you want to raise your question quickly, and then we'll give Peter the last word. Okay. Hi. Uh, I was just going to ask. You touched on this a little bit, but uh, if different types of perceptions for different like types of entities are relevant. So like she seems to be skeptical about human perception because we have this whole class of things that we perceive that is like different in tons of ways from the things that everything else might perceive. So I was just wondering if, if that's relevant at all <laughs> into like what sort of things we might be able to conceive versus what sort of things like, I don't know, a rock might be able to conceive or something. Yeah. So, so there's two, there's at least two types of perception in Cavendish. And there's also, I mean, as far as I'm aware in the literature, there's at least two sets of distinctions between two types of perception. So there's, people talk about the difference between um, sensitive perception and rational perception. And at least as I talk about it in the paper, sensitive perception is like perception via one of the five senses. Rational perception involves is, is, is imagining, conceiving, thinking, reflecting. Um, humans do both of those. Uh, and then there's this other distinction, which is, I mean, the, I don't know how useful the terms are sometimes because this is something I, but interior and exterior perception and sometimes exterior perception is called animal perception right which is a distinction between so so interior perception is the is the is perception simpliciter the the thing that everything does and which i which everything does in order and if it's part of nature it's doing that uh but 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 whereas the animal slash sensitive perception is something that animals and humans do um and I definitely think it's relevant to what I'm doing because I, again, just to come back to the, the thing that I think maybe I need to work on is that I maybe suggest that for both of these thinkers, you can work out what's conceivable and therefore possible on the basis of uh, the perception that humans can do. But then I start talking about this much more general type of perception towards the end of the paper. So I, so I definitely think it's important and something that I need to get clearer on when I go back to this. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, given that we have one session canceled uh, for today, uh, we can circle around for some quick follow-ups if there's any outstanding issues. Um, I think Colin was next in the queue. Um, I would also encourage people to, if they haven't already, to look at the Zoom group chat where there's quite a fruitful discussion going, including um, references to many of the primary sources involved. Will I be able to find this at a later point? Yes, this chat will be available uh, online after the after the conference. Uh, sure. So I sort of want to follow up on something Shoshana raised. I think it's really interesting. Maybe ask another kind of Cavendish question. Um, so the way Shoshana described um, empiricism. Um, as like learning about the world from like the outside rather than the inside. I think that that model is like really interesting and complicated when applied to Cavendish because I think an important part of her view is that like what's inside is basically the same kind of stuff as what's outside. So I almost think that she would be okay with the idea that we learn about the material world using just our imagination, even if it's somewhat disconnected from sense perception, because it's just like us learning what the properties of matter uh, mm -hmm. that are inside and outside. Um, so I wonder if there's like something going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and then my question for Peter, this is something that I pressed you on in my comments a little bit. Um, I, so what you need to argue for Cavendish is the claim that if something um, 
can exist, then it can be perceived. Or in other words, it's perceptible. Mm -hmm. But so far as I can tell, like all of the arguments that you present, and, kind of, and maybe the arguments that I like try to offer you, <laughs> like if something does exist in nature, then it is in fact perceived. So I guess I just kind of worry that there's like a little bit of a slide there, especially if like the official project is to explain why Cavendish thinks that inconceivability implies impossibility. Uh, yeah, I, I was just going to say one thing about the the, the, the thing about um, uh, you can understand the world through your imagination. I mean, maybe of relevance to Cavendish in her fiction writing, she makes it clear she literally thinks you create worlds with your imagination, um, yeah. which is one of the craziest things. So when you write a novel, there's a little material world somewhere that actually exists. Um, uh, yeah, so coming, I think there's a way to do, I think there's a way of establishing that she thinks that all parts of nature necessarily are perceived. Um, but I agree that as it currently stands, the evidence that I provide shows that like all parts of nature exist and are perceived, but there's not necessarily something joining those two things together. Um, I mean, this is why I thought that I thought the plant, the fact that she's a planist might be able to get me there. Because, and, but, but you, but you, you showed, you know, you gave me some reasons to think that that's maybe not the case. But, but my reasoning, at least in terms of what I've written so far, was like everything. It's if it's in nature, right? It's none of it is just sitting there. She's like she's so not mechanist in that sense, right? Whereas the mechanist, it, it, you know, according to someone like Cavendish, the mechanists think you just have your material objects and they just sit there until something knocks into them like a domino. Uh, whereas she thinks that even if something is just like, as, even if you've got a rock that's right there, it's like doing something the whole time. It's like a, it's like a rope that's really taut and it looks like it's still, but it's actually, there's loads of stuff going on there. Um, so I guess my, like in my kind of, and this isn't an argument, it's just a, the, the way I'm, the reason that I think that there's a way of getting there is like, if everything is doing something um, and it's doing something to the stuff around it and the world is a plenum, then, and everything that, and doing just means perceiving, like all activity is perceptual activity for Cavendish, just as it is with, uh, with Barclay. So yeah, that, that so, but I, I, I but yeah, there's some, there's, I got to find a way to, to, to connect the dots there. But thanks. You, you give me lots of stuff to think about. Uh, all right, we have a follow up from Jonathan. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I just started thinking about this. So um, I don't know if you agree with the following, but I'm committed to its being true. Um, the complete blending is contingent. So God could have, uh, didn't, but could have created a world of only inanimate matter. Um, uh, so, okay, you're on board, good. Um, and in that world, nothing would ever change. So she like tells you what it would be like. It seems like she can conceive of it. Um, in that world, there's no animate matter, which means there's no life and there's no perception. Um, so you would have to claim that her reasoning about this world was counter possible reasoning. Um, I'm committed to treating it as counterfactual rather than counter possible. I know Lewis Powell for a reason he has yet to divulge to me believes it's counter possible reasoning. <laughs> um, so you could go that route. Um, but that to me seems to be trouble to you, tr trouble for you. Mm hmm that lump world where nothing ever changes and is therefore also, I mean, it has the innate fixed knowledge that she thinks inanimate matter has, which is to say it knows that God exists. But other than that, there's no perceiving in that world. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I, I just remembered this. Colin also raised this, it, this, this example with me. I, I, I haven't, um, that seems like an issue. I haven't thought about it in any great depth. And I, I don't want to say anything because I, because I haven't really looked at that passage in much, in much, in much depth yet. But, but yeah, thanks for raising that, that one again. Uh, all right, as an update, uh, we are going to be starting um, the next talk 15 minutes after the hour. Uh, so to leave the same five minute break as before, that means we have uh, seven minutes for any, any last follow ups.
Uh, I believe there's a follow-up from Graham Clay. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and I wonder how you, depending on how you go on that um, question from Jonathan, uh, you might end up with the consistency principle. Um, it might be that the reasons that you cash out once this gets more precise at the end of your final section and you settle how you're going to fall, you know, how you're going to fall on this question, it might turn out that um, the counter possible stuff, if that's what you have to do, entails contradictions uh, for everything that's not perceived. Uh, but then you end up with the consistency principle again, um, the, the one from Holden. Um, so I was just wanted to point out that depending on where you go on this, if you go really hard against Jonathan and his counterfactual story, you might end up with contradictions for anything that's not perceived or perceivable. And then you're back with the, you're back dealing with the debate we talked about at the beginning, uh, depending on how that cashes out. So that might be something to be uh, cautious of, at least if you're going to take a stand against the consistency version of the uh, inconceivability principle. Yeah, thanks. Um, my gut wants to hold on to conceivability, but uh, but maybe maybe because I think because the thing I'm interested in is why why all these early moderns thought you can make robust claims based on what you can conceive. Um, but I guess if it if it's not if it doesn't in in the case of Barclay and and maybe the case of Cavendish, it doesn't have to be one or the other consistency or conceivability. It might just be that they conceive. I think that there's I think that maybe there's a reading that exists of Barclay that's like this that conceivability is a term which sometimes means this thing and sometimes means this thing and like sometimes it means consistency and sometimes it means much more like empirical like you just can't imagine it and. Maybe maybe there's a way of just using the term that in that broader way in both the case of Cavendish and Barclay, and obviously if it helps me uh, account for the the uh, inanimate world in Cavendish, that would be good too. Yeah, yeah. I'm 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 just thinking that however you bottom out the inconceivability claim, it's going to have to do with the things being conceived or perceived or whatever, um, and then whether well, that's going to ultimately probably if you go hard against Jonathan, end up with a claim about the nature of things being incompatible. And so then that would be contradictions. So that, that was just the thought. And yeah, I can see you, you've got a lot of options here. I don't, I don't think you should worry. I, I mean, you can go any way. I think you can go with both of them. You can run the paper with both or you can run it with one and just push back against Jonathan and punt on that and just say, hey, I'll defend that in another paper. You don't have to do everything in this paper. Um, so. Good, that's good to know. <laughs> Uh, have I neglected anyone from the chat who wants to get in? Uh, well, if not, uh, Jonathan, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, I was going to say some of her comments about inconceivability um, are predicated on the way that God actually created the world. So I wonder if for example, the complete blending, like the fact that there is both animate and inanimate matter in every part and particle of nature. Um, she says it's inconceivable for the world to be any other way, given the way God created it. <laughs> so it's like weirdly right. actuality. Um, but she has that notion of like inconceivability given, um, and it doesn't seem to be like given all the stuff God made true or, all, or like everything that's true in the world. It's not like a necessitism kind of thing. It's just like, um, inconceivability given some particular thing that he did. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, because he can do stuff that breaks our concepts because he created the universe from nothing. He somehow did it outside of time. She thinks that's all inconceivable. Um, but maybe like given what he did for whatever reason he did it, then there are some things that are inconceivable and those things that are inconceivable are also impossible. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, one thing that's interesting about Cavendish, I guess, tell, tell me if this sounds right or wrong, is that because she d she basically gives God l freedom to do just about anything because he's completely detached from what, what we can conceive in a way that like he isn't maybe for the Cartesians or something like that because there's, there's like the world and then there's God and we have, I mean, she's, she's pretty clear that we have literally no idea of what God is like. Um, 
Yeah. So maybe, so do you think it might be true that Cavendish thinks conceivability entails inconceivability entails impossibility in this world? I, I don't have an objection. I can't produce a, a textual yeah. problem with that. I don't know if that is good enough for the analogy you want to draw with, with Barclay. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, no, I just, I, yeah. Yeah. I, that, I, that could be right. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone for a very fruitful discussion. Uh, we will be back in five minutes. Uh, 15 minutes after the hour for Hase Hamelinen's paper on Kant's long shadow on the interpretation of Swedenborg. So you're all invited uh, to participate in that as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody. Um, and I just want to re uh, remind everybody that uh, if you want to have your name added to the card for Steve, for those of you that uh, came a little bit late, uh, uh, Steve Daniel had a heart attack um, and is in a hospital and is not able to uh, uh, participate today. So we've uh, canceled this session, but uh, if you were sending a card uh, as a group, if you'd like to have your name added to the card, please send me a, a private message in chat and I will uh, uh, add your name and then respond that I've noted it. So uh, thanks. We'll see everybody in about uh, five minutes. <laughs>